I V M. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy. As you are aware, the first high-level face-to-face strategic dialogue between the United States and China since President Joe Biden took office happened last week in the northern city of U.S. Anchorage in Alaska. The temperature outside was extremely cold, ranging between minus 18 to minus 20 degrees Celsius, which also resembles the state of U.S.-China relations that have plunged into a deep freeze since 2018 trade negotiations started. I am Suyash Desai, and to discuss more about this, we are joined by Manoj Keval Raman. Uh, hi, Manoj. Hi, Suyash. So, Manoj, before we talk about what happened between China and the US in Alaska, I would like you to briefly tell us what happened before the dialogue, as in how US approached its allies, what happened between US and Japan just before the Anchorage summit happened, or Anchorage meeting happened. Yeah, so it's been uh, an interesting, you know, 12, 13 days. Uh, of diplomacy, I mean, to me, uh, and I tweeted about this, it seems like, you know, there is this shift that's taking place in the world order, and we are seeing the evolution of it in front of our eyes. Um, when Biden took charge, one of the first sort of concerns around the world, particularly in sort of this part of the world, our part of the world, was that, uh, are we going to see Biden dump the Indo-Pacific as a concept? Um, this concept came under the Trump administration, it fructified in the form of Two plus two dialogues uh, between different countries, including the U.S. and Japan, the U.S. and South Korea, the U.S. and India, the U.S. and Australia, and that sort of. And obviously, we saw the Quad meetings that were happening. We saw an Indo-Pacific strategy document come out under Trump, which spoke about you know preserving American interests uh, while working with allies and partners, which identified China and Russia as particular threats. And those were all sort of really interesting developments. And I mean, if you remember towards the you know, fag end of the Trump administration after Trump had lost the election, the U.S. declassified uh, that internal report on the Indo-Pacific strategy, which was, again, very interesting reading because China was seen as primarily the threat, but and Russia was seen as a marginal player in that in some ways. Yet, these are the two sort of big ideas that were there in that, apart from other things about alliances. When Joe Biden took charge, there was this concern about, are we going to see the U.S. continue with this policy? In some ways, the concern was slightly misplaced because what we did see was that, you know, there was an Indo-Pacific command that had been created, that strategy document that was out there. Uh, certain changes had taken place in U.S. posture. So we knew that there would be a continuation, but to what degree would the U.S. continue this policy? Would this policy be based on, you know, an anti-China sort of prism with military first, as opposed to other sort of, you know, other areas of competition, such as economics, technology. And in the, in that, working with partners rather than, telling partners that either you're with us or you're against us, ban, ban Huawei, do this, do that. So that stylistic and substantive change we were waiting for, whether that's taking place. What we saw in the initial days of the Joe Biden administration was them giving assurances to allies and partners. There were conversations with the Japanese, with the South Koreans, with India, uh, with the Europeans. And all of these conversations revolved around a range of issues beyond just military cooperation. Um, and that was the first sort of step. All the military cooperation and sort of reaffirming those alliances was important also in the narrative. What we then saw was that there was no conversation directly, or at least publicly that we know of, apart from, say, back-channel conversation that might have taken place between the Chinese and the Americans. Um, they waited. They waited. In February, you had a call between Joe Biden and Xi Jinping, which sort of set the tone that, yes, we will have competition, but we will try to avoid, avoid confrontation and we will work where we can. Anthony Blinken was very clear when he said that, you know, our relationship be, relationship should be cooperative where it should be, competitive where it uh, must be, and again, adversarial where it must be. So the prism was much more broader rather than just simply adversarial. Now, heading into the Anchorage talks, um, this is where we were. Prior to the talks, you saw uh, Secretary of State Blinken and uh, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin travel to South Korea and Japan. In the two plus two dialogues over there, uh, the dialogue with the Japanese was very, very clear message to China. 
And there was a clear paragraph in the joint statement that was issued, which called out China's coercive practices by name. It talked about a free and open Indo-Pacific. It talked about some very clear sort of visions of what that free and open Indo-Pacific should be. And that sort of really annoyed Beijing, firstly, because it was mentioned by name. And secondly, because there was a very, very clear rebuke of what the Chinese policies were. And again, reaffirming the alliances. What also came out after that meeting was, you know, the the statement sort of also included comments about Xinjiang, about Hong Kong, uh, about the South China Sea, about Taiwan. What also came out after the meeting was uh, reports about how the Japanese had committed to support American action in case of a Taiwan contingency, uh, which was, again, uh, I mean, I haven't recalled this being said publicly for the longest time. So perhaps it was the first time when this was so clearly spelled out. All of this obviously piqued the Chinese and you got a very, very stern, strong response from the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs as, as one would have expected. There was a rebuke of the idea of creating block confrontation and trying to encircle China. There was a lot of backlash against Japan. You know, I mean, Saudi Jian specifically called Japan, Japan's behavior as uh, the behavior of a, quote, strategic vassal of the United States. I haven't heard that language again for the longest time. And again, there's a big difference from what the Chinese and Japanese relationship had evolved under Shinzo Abe, which had very serious competitive trends, but had also towards the latter half become somewhat cooperative. I mean, Shinzo Abe had visited China for that summit with Xi Jinping to sort of reset ties. So this is a change, right? There's clear competition and aggression there. At the same time, you had a conversation with the South Koreans and the Americans, which did not mention China, but it spoke about the sort of free and open Indo-Pacific and those sorts of ideas about working together jointly. And it was much more milder. And again, Beijing didn't sort of respond as aggressively to that because they saw it as, you know, a partly weakness of the American administration. Again, another thing that happened leading up to this Anchorage talks was, uh, you know, the Chinese NPC ended, parliamentary session ended. It authorized the changes to Hong Kong's election system with Beijing getting far more control. Soon after that, you had the U.S. Department, State Department sanctioning 24 Chinese, sorry, PRC and Hong Kong officials. Some of these, I think about 14 of these are vice chairpersons of the National People's Congress Standing Committee. So that's uh, a very high in the pecking order in Beijing. So that's, again, something that annoyed Beijing, particularly when this dialogue had been announced and this sort of sanction came just a day or so before the dialogue was going to take place. And you can see that, uh, you know, that Beijing felt slighted by this. And I don't know, I don't think that they should have anticipated something different. I mean, Americans would have waited, but this is also them sending a strong message to Beijing and also to their domestic constituencies that uh, we will be standing up for values and human rights. So that's the sort of background within which this takes place. Of course, I haven't mentioned the Quad Summit, but that happened uh, a week or so before this Anchorage Summit on March 12th. And that again sent a message to Beijing about what American engagement is going to be all about. It's going to be about working with partners to deliver outcomes uh, and they identified specific areas from vaccines to climate change to technology, which again are areas which will have an impact on Beijing. There was very little talk and nothing publicly about uh, military partnerships, but then the two plus two dialogue did some of that. And again, uh, Lloyd Austin then visited India uh, and reaffirmed that military relationship and the commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific. The both sides reaffirmed that. So it just sends a message to Beijing about how America is acting and how America is posturing itself. Uh, and Beijing, of course felt that sense of slight and concern, but at the same time, it wanted to go and have this dialogue. It felt that it was important for it to go and have this dialogue. And that's a little bit of a sense of how American diplomacy has had an impact on Beijing. That despite everything, uh, Yang Jiechi, uh, who is the chief of the Foreign Affairs Commission, and Wang Yi, uh, who is the foreign minister and state councillor, ended up going to Anchorage for this conversation. They could have pulled out, but they ended up choosing to go. And even leading up to the conversation, if you read what the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is saying, it's talking about the need to engage in dialogue with the US. So it tells you that despite all of this, Beijing wanted this conversation. So that's some strong foundation on which the Anchorage dialogue happened. Uh, also, Bamanoj, I would like to point out that and what from what you have highlighted in this uh, initial remarks, uh, US's foreign policy appears to be taking a leaf out of Trump's foreign policy, but a bit more in an organized fashion and not in a haphazard way that Trump conducted. So uh, the threat or dealing with China would more or less be this in the similar way, but much, much more institutionalized and taking uh, alliances and partners into consideration. It's, it's not just that. I think there is a reimagination of the nature of the policy. 
for example, if you listen to what Biden administration officials said, and there was a briefing by two unidentified State Department officials prior to uh, the Anchorage uh, meeting. And what they said essentially was that, you know, that, uh, you know, we are looking at this relation, this Indo-Pacific strategy, and our China strategy fits within this broader Indo-Pacific strategy, and it fits within our broader approach to national security. So that's the important thing to keep in mind, right? That the China strategy will sit into that. And it's not that China first, Asia, and Indo-Pacific second. It's saying that the Indo-Pacific we need to look at, and then we need to look at China. And that's an important shift conceptually, because if you don't make that shift, you don't then look at nodes of cooperation like vaccines, technology, which are beyond just denying China or competing with China, which are about providing solutions and outcomes to the region so that you yourself are a valuable actor in the region and and relationships with you or your groupings add value to other countries in the region. Uh, and that's very different from positing yourself as to, the, to other countries, whether it's Indonesia, Singapore, Bangladesh, whoever else, saying that either you work with us or you work with the Chinese. No, here you're providing a model of this is what we can do for you and this is the terms under which we can do it for you. And you pick and you need to make your proposition far more attractive than what the Chinese are proposing rather than presenting it as confrontation. And I think that's the conceptual shift that's happening. Hmm. That's very insightful, Manoj. Uh, so moving on to the Anchorage Dialogue, you already mentioned that Yang Jiechi and uh, Wang were all uh, present in where the party were participating from China's side. Who were the other participants from US's side? And what happened during the meeting? Was the expectation too high? Or be, as you have pointed out already that this all happened, so the expectation from the meeting was too less. What happened during, what transcribed during the meeting? So essentially what happened during the meeting was, first let's look at heading into the meeting, right? And what is the message? So I'll just firstly finish off the idea of who was participating from the US side. So this was a dialogue between uh, Yang Jiechi, who, like I said, is the chief of the Foreign Affairs Commission. And he is also the senior most diplomat in the party system because he is the only diplomat in the Politburo of the Communist Party, which again comprises of 25 people. So he's not even uh, very, very high in the ranking, but he's the senior most diplomat. And ya Wang Yi, who is the foreign minister and state councillor, who is with him. Uh, so these two are traveling to uh, the US and they are meeting Jake Sullivan, who is the who's Biden's national security advisor, and uh, Anthony Blinken, who is uh, secretary of state. And that's the sort of senior level conversation that's happening. You also have obviously other officials from the US side uh, who are part of the team on China. So for example, Kurt Kandel, Kastoshi, those guys are attending. You also have uh, Chinese officials uh, attending, uh, junior Chinese officials attending with uh, them. And you of course have the interpreters who become very, very famous in Beijing after Yang Yechi's long uh, night drive. But uh, so that's the essential stage that's been set. Uh, and you're having this dialogue. Uh, what Heading into the dialogue, both sides essentially sought to downplay uh, in some ways. Uh, there was a bit of a tiff about what do we call this? And that was playing out in public. The Americans were saying that, look, this is just a conversation. This is the beginning of a process. This is about just sitting down, getting to know each other, explaining where we are coming from, understanding where they are coming from. We're not going to be talking about specific issues or looking at specific solutions or anything like that. You know, one of the comments that I said, you know, from the State Department briefing, previewing the talks uh, by so there were these two unidentified officials from the State Department who spoke to reporters uh, and previewing the talks, they basically said this, uh, and I'll quote them, we know that sometimes there is a sense, potentially a perception, or maybe it's a hope in Beijing that our public message is somehow different than our private message. And we think it's really important that we dispel the idea very early, that we are very clear with delivering the same messages in private that you have heard from us in public. And, it, and they talk about, you know, that we'll be talking about Xinjiang, Hong Kong, economic coercion of our allies and partners, China's activities across Taiwan Strait, economic issues and the rest of it. They very clearly talk about the fact that, even, and even Jake Sullivan said this in one of his briefings before the summit, that we are not looking at things like tariffs, rolling back tariffs or anything like that. Those are specifics. We'll talk about that. We'll consult with our allies and partners and then we'll get on all that. But right now, it's just about understanding where each other comes from. Um, and that's that's sort of a very, very low bar. You're not expecting anything significant to come up. The US side also specifically ruled out a judge. There was, like I said, some public sparring about what do we call this? The Americans were saying that this is just a conversation about these, these issues. The Chinese were saying this is a strategic dialogue, which has specific significance because there was a strategic dialogue framework that was established just a little bit pre-Obama under Bush, 
uh, and then sort of under Obama, it became far more solidified. And Trump it continued for a while before it completely fell away because of the nature of uh, the confrontation that developed between the two sides. Um, and the Americans were essentially backing away from calling it a strategic dialogue or, or any of those formal mechanisms. This looked at this as one of the informal things. Um, the other sort of, from a Chinese point of view, I mean, the Chinese said very little about what they wanted out of it. So it seemed like they were interested in listening and getting the conversation started and putting their points across because they kept saying, look, our core interests, our system, you don't sort of infringe on that. And sorry, but you know, gone are the days of the past where you could do those things, you no longer do those things, uh, and that's just not right. And the U.S. needs to correct its behavior. That was their sort of primary thing, and correct its behavior and wrong policies, what they call wrong policies, which tells you that they wanted a reversal on things like the pressure on Huawei, uh, the tensions with regard to, you know, the use of entity lists in the U.S. to block uh, core technology exports to China, visa restrictions on party members, sanctions on, you know, Hong Kong officials, challenges with regards to journalists, uh, the issue of the closure of the Chinese consulate in Houston, and essentially sort of talk about those things and going back to normal over there. There was also some suggestion, and the Wall Street Journal reported this about, you know, the possibility of re-establishing high-level dialogue through a structured formal mechanism, which is a, which would be a smart thing from a Chinese point of view, because it creates a framework in which things then gradually normalize to what they, what they were. Um, that would be what they would have hoped for. And also probably potentially a scheduling of a virtual summit between Xi Jinping and Joe Biden in April sometime. So those are things that the Wall Street Journal reported. The Chinese didn't confirm any of this. Essentially, that's where the expectations were. They weren't great. When the meeting started, what we saw was, you know, brief opening comments from both sides, which were not brief, uh, really. Uh, in, I think uh, both sides ended up accusing each other of breaking protocol. Uh, there was a bit of a back and forth with... Uh, after, after young J, after, sorry, after Anthony Blinken and Jake Sullivan's comments, which, uh, young J took off a front to because he felt that he was being lectured in his, in the opening comments because the Americans were talking about how we will talk about our values and Hong Kong and this and that and everything. And young J essentially responded with a very lengthy sort of, uh, diatribe, right? Uh, he said that, uh, look, I think he spoke for about 16 minutes, which is very, very unusual in this context. And he talked about how, you know, uh, the Americans had essentially erred in their policies, how they hadn't really, you know, followed constructive engagement. He pushed back on the idea of values saying that the U.S. does not represent international public opinion and U.S. values are not international values. Every system has its own merit and so on and so forth. Uh, Wang Yi pushed back saying about the Hong sanctions on Hong Kong saying, you just did this prior to us arriving here. And I'm going to quote him. He said, this is not supposed to be the way one should welcome his guests. So there was sort of friction on that. Young Yechi was very, very tough in his entire, I mean, he was basically delivering a lecture talking about the limitations of American democracy, the failings of American foreign policy, uh, the use of, for the wanton sort of use of force by America and its so-called long-arm jurisdiction to carry out regime change uh, and, you know, bully and, uh, you know, trouble other countries. He talks about human rights and he sort of attacked the U.S. on racism and the rest of it, saying, who are you to tell us about human rights and those sorts of things. And he also had this sort of very clear warning to the U.S. saying, you want to have conf confrontation? What's the logic of confrontation? It hasn't served you well in the past and we will survive confrontation. So he was very, very firm, very, very aggressive. Uh, he pushed back on all of that. In response, obviously, Blinken said, well, if you have made these comments, which are so extended, we need to also talk. And there was a bit of a careful about keeping the media back so the media covers it. Uh, Blinken pushed back. Sullivan pushed back. They both basically spoke about very similar things like saying, look, we don't like, don't, we don't not see our failings. Of course, America has failings and our job is to, and we've always said this, you know, we want to create a more perfect union and that requires having our failings out in the open, discussing them. And sometimes you succeed, sometimes you don't do well. But at the end of the day, we end up doing things because we talk about them publicly and we're not sort of worried about that. And this idea that you're talking about, we don't talk about for the world and we don't sort of, and our, you know, that are, uh, that you don't believe our allies are saying that because, because young Yeji talk, spoke about Japan and South Korea saying, well, you talk about allies and partners. Do you realize that Japan and South Korea are among our biggest trading partners? Uh, so while you want to develop better relations with them, good. But, uh, so do we have a very strong relationship. So, you know, you want to be part of this region, great, you can be part of this region, but don't try and bully people around. And sort of 
Blinken pushed back saying, uh, that's not what we are hearing from our partners. What we are hearing from our partners is that they are very happy that America is back and America is engaged in the region, unlike what it was in the last four years and so forth. So they pushed back against these ideas. And then obviously Yang Jiechi and Wang Yi said, well, if you've spoken once more, so must we. And the media was being shunted out. And, you know, you had clips and videos of Yang Jiechi again lashing out. And I'm going to quote what Yang Jiechi said in that last bit, which is available on video. Then he said, so was this all carefully planned and was it all carefully orchestrated with all the preparations in place? Is that what you had hoped to conduct this dialogue? Is that the way you had hoped to conduct this dialogue? Well, I think we thought too well of the United States. We thought that the U.S. side would follow necessary diplomatic protocols. So for China, it was necessary that we made our position clear. So let me say here that in front of the Chinese side, the United States does not have the qualification to say that it wants to speak to China from a position of strength. The U.S. side was not even qualified to say such things even 20 years or 30 years back because this is not the way you deal with the Chinese people. Um, so he was basically pushing back. And like I said, he accused the Americans of violating protocol. The Americans accused the Chinese of violating protocol because uh, Yang Jiechi went on for so long. Actually. At the end of all this theatrics, which sort of enthused everybody, uh, was a dialogue that took place over a period of two days. When that dialogue ended, despite all of this acrimony, both sides labeled it constructive. Uh, and that's something that we need to keep in mind. And that's partly to do with the low bar that was set. Why did they call it constructive? Well, if you, from the Chinese side, you should have, they should have a very long statement. It talked about the first half of that statement, or maybe the first three-fourths of that statement, is all about, uh, you know, how we had candid, in-depth, long-time and constructive communication. And we talked about all sorts of issues. Uh, and then it's a big defense of the Chinese system, which they call as a red line that the US, U.S. must not cross. They talked about not imposing democratic values and, you know, issues like and interfering because over issues of human rights. They talk about multilateralism and not creating cliques, which can uh, sort of, you know, uh, which can sort of interfere with other countries or basically creating these specialized groupings, which can uh, interfere with the way China sees multilateralism. And there's a huge thing about uh, internal affairs like Taiwan, or the Chinese call internal affairs, Taiwan, Hong Kong, South China Sea, Xinjiang, and the rest of it. But after the end of that, there is this thing of, you know, we've agreed on establishing a joint working group on climate change. Again, that's something that the U.S. has said that it's interested in doing under Biden. Uh, they talk about the U.S. reiterating its stance on the One China policy, which is perfectly fine. And they talk about, you know, reciprocal arrangements for COVID-19 vaccination, uh, sort of facilitate things for diplomats and council officials, uh, and also try to make things easier potentially for reporters, you know, personnel of consular missions uh, and things like that. And again, those are things that will happen over time potentially because right now things are quite different. They talked about other issues, which was, uh, you know, the Korean Peninsula, Afghanistan, Myanmar. Uh, they talk about uh, Iran and the Chinese statement mentions all of that, that we discussed all of this. Blinken's and Sullivan's comments after the event, after the dialogue was very, very short. Uh, the most important part of that was Blinken saying that, look, when we asked them about Xinjiang, Tibet, Taiwan and cyber issues, we got a quote unquote defensive response on, uh, yet he also sort of says that, you know, and I'm going to quote Blinken, on Iran, on North Korea, on Afghanistan, on climate change, our interests intersect. On economics, on trade, on technology, we told our counterparts that we are reviewing these issues with close consultation with Congress and with our allies and partners. So I think this is, uh, it tells you what where they can work, the two sides can work. And that's probably the outcome that we need to keep in mind while realizing that uh, competition and contestation will continue, particularly over values. That's that's very detailed, Manoj. Also, I would like to bring your attention to the two points. One, you said that media was present during the conversation. So that's strange because generally these talks happen in closed doors and general statements are issued. So one, why was the media present? Do we have any information about that? And second point, what are the post-dialogue things that have happened? So, for example, in your starting remark, you said about the starting of the change of world order. What is that? Uh, how has China reacted domestically and internationally post the dialogue? And how has US reacted domestically and internationally post the dialogue? Yeah, I mean, the first point of the media, look, the media is generally present during opening remarks in any of these meetings. I mean, even the Quad Summit, while the rest of the conversation happened uh, behind closed doors, the media was present there for the opening remarks of all the leaders. So this was those cursory opening remarks, which went on for one hour, which should have usually gone on for like 15 minutes, maybe 10, 12 minutes. So this is uh, this was in that context. So it was not unusual for the media to be present. 
the other bit about how things have evolved since then look what's happened is that once the chinese have gotten back they have had consultation with their partners so you've seen russian foreign minister sergey lavrov travel to china and meeting wang yi and gulin i'll get into the statement that they issued but you've also seen xi jinping and uh, north korea's kim jong un exchange messages and again when blinken says that our interests intersect on north korea um you can see why those engagements are important Beijing is also going and telling its partners what it spoke about uh, and what it discussed, um, and that's I think important to note because you don't want to end up from Beijing's perspective, you don't want to end up having them suspect you of cutting deals because tensions are rife between Russia and the U.S. too. Because after the summit, you had a statement also from Joe Biden calling Putin a killer, and that's again something that's been picked up. So I think. uh that's the first thing from a chinese point of view that beijing's also reaching out to its partners and trying to sort of uh inform them talk to them uh, and align you know their policies at the same time you've seen the us also do something very similar and secretary austin was in india at the time of these conversations you also saw uh, after this conversation uh, you're seeing secretary blinken travel to brussels he's going to be there talking to eu officials he's going to be there talking at the nato summit and china will be a key part of that conversation at the same time what we've seen is that there were coordinated sanctions that were announced uh, by the EU Canada UK UK and US uh, on two chinese officials uh, with regard to Xinjiang and again that was a coordinated step that was taken the EU went first and then the rest of them announced and there was even a joint statement by the rest of them beijing responded to that very very angrily uh, and they sanctioned uh, you know uh, member indiv- eu individuals in the from the european union they also sanctioned uh, european institutions um these individuals from the european union were researchers uh, even a member of the european parliament from germany who has been particularly critical of beijing and you have uh, you know institutions such as merics which is a research institution but also european union institutions have been sanctioned and the sanctions are very strict they're even talking about uh, not just uh, for these individuals they're not just talking about sanctioning these individuals but also their family members and associates so it's fairly harsh sanctions that beijing has announced uh, and beijing obviously says these are counter measures and at the same time you've seen a rhetorical pushback about look you are not going to be instructors on human rights to us uh, at the same time you've seen the foreign ministry say things like you know gone are the days when you could interfere in china's internal affairs you just can't do that anymore. Uh, and there's obviously a threat to the European Union and the deal with uh, the comprehensive investment agreement that you have that sort of is sort of lying in balance. It was agreed upon in December 2020. So there's lots of that sort of flux is playing out, and we have to see what happens with Lincoln's trip to NATO. Um, I presume by the time this podcast airs, uh, the trip would be done with, and we'd have some sort of a statement out from NATO. Uh, and I presume China will be an important component of that. The Europeans have been generally shy in the last few months in their conversations. to mention china you know uh, in their conversations with the americans uh, so just before this anchorage summit uh, blinken also spoke to counterparts in uh, you know the european troika france germany the uk and the statements were different you know they didn't really talk about uh, the american statement spoke about the fact that they spoke about china the european statement didn't you know statements from the european side didn't speak about that as much and they've been generally very cautious this shift of them imposing sanctions was again something that was talked about for some months now because the european union passed its version of the magnitsky act which empowered it to sort of impose these sanctions and there was talk that this would come and now this sort of friction has played out we need to see how this goes forward so that's where i say that you know a lot has happened in the last 12 13 days where sort of you're seeing shifts in the world order taking place you're seeing biden's indo pacific policy uh, and this emphasis on values and human rights play out Uh, you see in beijing contest this while i'm talking about just values let me just you know, as part of the contestation tell you about the statement that the russians and the chinese issued there that was a really really interesting document uh, it talks about you know how lavrov's visit uh, allowed them to sort of engage with each other and talk about you know policies towards the united states the reports from china specifically mentioned that and then uh, you know wang yi's comments talk about how you know our strategic coordination is very very important as the international situation changes rapidly uh, they talk about how they're going to fight back against quote false information regarding china and russia and then the statement talks about global governance and it talks about how the system has become unbalanced calls for a 
emergency UN Security Council members summit to talk about issues. It talks about the first point in the statement is about human rights and it pushes the, the Chinese agenda on human rights, which is that, you know, sustainable development is primary, secondary. It's that every country should be able to practice their and protect human rights as per their national conditions, which is very different from the US conception of universal human rights. At the same time, they talk about don't politicize human rights, don't interfere in other countries by talking about human rights. They talk about, the second point is about democracy. And they say that, you know, democracy is an important achievement of human development, but there is no uniform standard democratic model. Uh, and it's a legitimate right of sovereign countries to independently choose their path. And that should be respected. The point three is about the international order. And it talks about how the international order must be structured around uh, you know, the international system, which is based on the UN at its core, uh, and then sort of rule of law and international law, which is very different from how, uh, you know, the rules-based order conceptualization, which the US talks about. And the Chinese are sort of making that difference very clear. They also made this difference very clear in Anchorage. So that's essentially, you can see how this contest is playing out and where this contest is going. It's about, it's about uh, national strength, so investing in yourself, growing, capable, growing your own capacity uh, for the Americans, that is accompanied with working with allies. For China, so it is. It's talking about its 14th five-year plan, spoke about domestic strength, domestic capacity by 2035, building a certain long-term China, which is strong. Uh, along with that, Beijing is now working with its partners like Russia. Then you've got this idea of contestation on uh, military contestation. So while we are talking, there is a contestation playing out between Beijing and Philippines in the South China Sea with a swarm of Chinese fishing vessels harassing uh, Philippines. Uh, and that's playing out right now as we speak. At the same time, you're seeing the tensions on the border with India, uh, talk about potential sort of Taiwan contingencies. You know, US officials particularly are saying that, look, that's much more real than we are imagining it. And then you have this issue on values and what should be the shape of the international order. So that's why I say what we've seen in the last 12, 15 days is serious flux that is now playing out about the with regard to the evolution of the international order going forward. Um, and all of these sort of events we'll talk about. On that very note, Manoj, thank you so much for your uh, insights on the recently conducted dialogue and the changing nature of, uh, or the, at least the start of the changing nature of world order uh, that's happening right now. You could subscribe to Manoj's newsletter, Eye on China, for more such news and analysis on US-China, US-India relations, China-India relations. We will also share the link in the show notes. Thank you, Manoj, and thank you for listening to All Things Peace. Thank you. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, Check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST or our website takshashila.org.in. I hope you enjoyed that show. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We'd like to thank the sponsors on the network this week, Siet Tires and The Whole Truth Foods. We really appreciate your support. So, on Cyrus Says, Sagarika Ghost, journalist, columnist, author, discusses books she has written, her experiences from reporting about the Babri Masjid demolition back in the day, and the upcoming state election. Cyrus also had a great episode with Devdath Patnayak last week. Do check that out. Chuck narrates an interesting story about a company that shared its virtual expertise with other companies and empowered the virtual world. No, we're not going to tell you what the brand is, but go check out The Origin of Things. And Chuck also came back on Simplified this week from episode 200 onwards. He's back. Go check that out if you haven't had a chance to do so so far. The Habit Coach Ashton was joined by Sapna Gopal Krishnan, his core trekker on Mount Kilimanjaro. They recollect the trek's memories and Sapna talks about the challenges she faced 
On All Things Policy, Rachid Chet talks to Sartak Pradhan about Delhi's water crisis. This is due to the pollution of his major water source, the River Yamuna, and he discusses the case against the state of Haryana. We had Manish Dangi, Chief Investment Officer of the Aditya Birla Sun Life Mutual Fund on Pesa Vesa with Anupam Gupta. They discussed India's financial report card with reference to the past decade, the hits and misses, and what the future of investing is going to look like. And with that, we hope to see you again next week. If you love cricket, listen up. The Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast is here for you. Hosted by DJ, Varun and me, Ashwin, we bring a fun, fresh fan's point of view to talking all things cricket. Sometimes it's just the three of us, sometimes we have guests, including current and former international cricketers. For new episodes every week, check out the Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast on the IVM app, website or wherever you get your podcasts.